Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series of lessons is on the Great Controversy. And you probably know that Adventists have a lot of study, a lot of time spent on discussing the Great Controversy. This is lesson number seven in that series for May 18 of 2024, entitled Motivated by Hope. Motivated by Hope. Well, let's see what it is. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we have gathered once again to consider your word and the implications of some of these less known portions of scripture, help us to understand them and to present the information as clearly as possible as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In this study, we're going to examine the 70-week prophecy and the 2300-day-slash-year prophecy. From the Bible Study Guide, Jim? A crucial point in the great controversy was the coming of the Messiah. During the 70-week prophetic period, the devil fought to destroy Israel's faith in the first coming of the Messiah as the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises, prophecies, and types. In the same way, by the end of the 2300-year prophetic time period, the forces of evil tried to obscure the, its fulfillment in the present, the pre in the pre-advent judgment occurring in the heavenly sanctuary and to sub press the proclamation to the, of the second coming of the Messiah. By the end of the 70 week period, week, excuse me, by the end of the 70 week prophetic period, there were faithful people of God, such as Simeon, who waited for the consolation of Israel, Luke 2, 25 from the New American Standard Bible or Anna and others who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Can you mention some non-Jews who got excited about the coming of the Messiah? How about the three Magi? Okay, that's a we great good. There. Can you think of some other Jews that were excited and informed at the last minute at least the about the coming of the smile? Huh? The shepherds. The shepherds, the shepherds absolutely. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. These faithful few saw in Jesus the fulfillment of the promise of the first coming of the Messiah. In the same way, there were, by the end of the 2300 years, believing people such as William Miller, whose present truth message focused on the hope in the soon appearing, excuse me, in the soon appearing of the Messiah. Miller did not discover the message through a philosophical method, methodology but through a literal reading of the scriptures. This illustrates once again the, essentially, the essentiality of scripture to the great controversy from the Bible study guide. Okay, so that's going to link us into our overall theme about the great controversy. So what is the hope that motivates us, Charles? The second coming of Jesus is one of the central themes of the scripture. It is a golden thread that runs through the Bible's sacred pages. One scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references of Christ's second coming in the Old Testament. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are more than 300 references of the return of Christ. One in every 25 verses mentions it. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. Wow, from our Bible study guide again. So it sounds like the second coming of Christ is a pretty big deal, right? Yes. Revelation 12 suggests that when the woman fled to the wilderness, the dragon, that is Satan, he, he's identified as Satan, tried to chase her and, test and destroy her. And that would be shortly after, well, even while some of the apostles were still alive, he was already trying to destroy that church. However, God protected her. One of the ways in which God protected his faithful people was by directing them to leave the areas of conflict and persecution and flee to the new world. And if you're interested to find out what happened to this woman and what became of her, read Revelation 17, 1 through 8. We don't have time to do that right now, but it's a little clue. 
Starting with Joel, the Bible predicts that the end will be preceded by dark days, the moon turned to blood, and stars falling from heaven. It also predicts that there will be terrible earthquakes. And Joel 1, 15, 2, 10, 11, on November 1, 1755, there was an enormous earthquake located off the coast of Portugal in which 60,000 people are estimated to have been killed. Much of the city of Les Lisbon was destroyed. About 25 years later, a dark day occurred at, in the northeastern United States. We, we, we now know that it was a result of a massive forest fire up in Canada, followed by a night during which the moon looked like it was made of blood. People noticed these things and asked themselves, do these things have anything to do with what is prophesied in the Bible? Hmm, what a thought. Eighteen years later, in 1798, the Pope was taken captive by General Berthier of Napoleon's forces and taken to France, where he died. It looked like the period of papal supremacy had come to an end. People began, and of course, that's we've talked already about that in our lessons, but um, a period of papal supremacy, how long did it last? 1260 years. Yeah, 1260 years. People began to search their Bibles to determine whether these things could possibly be harbingers of the Second Coming. A farmer in the upstate New York by the name of William Miller decided to determine for himself if this was true. He started with Genesis 1-1. I mean, you know, if you're going to start, you might as well start at the beginning, right? And worked his way through the Bible, determining that he would not proceed beyond any verse that he could not understand. He had a concordance, and he would look up everything he could to help him understand each verse as he proceeded. Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide, the Protestant reformers and the pilgrims who left from Holland for the New World longed for the coming of Jesus. For them, the second coming of Christ was a joyous event that they eagerly anticipated. Let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> Do you know one of the main reasons why the pilgrims left Actually, yeah, the pilgrims left uh, England and went to Holland and then later came to the United States. Something called persecution? Well, very specifically, their pastor was killed, arrested and killed. So they thought it's probably time to move. They also went to places like Cappadocia, Cappadocia. Yeah, in, uh, right. okay. John Wycliffe looked forward to the coming of Christ as the hope of the church. Calvin spoke for all the reformers when he talked of the glorious return of Christ as, quote, of all events most auspicious. For faithful men and women of God, the second coming of Christ was something to be embraced, not something to be feared. That's a happy thought, right? From our Bible study guide again. Jesus himself and the early apostles gave ringing promises that he would return. Myra? John 14, 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. American Bible Society. Okay. Then another place, 1 Thessalonians 4, this is one of Paul's earliest books. What, uh, what we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Sounds like Paul was planning to live until Jesus came and comes again, didn't he? <laughs> so then, encourage one another with these words. Um, and you could, there's a similar passage in Titus too. It is easy, well Jim, go ahead, you can jump on there. It is easy to understand why the belief in the second coming of Christ has brought such hope and joy to the Bible-believing Christians. It points forward to the end of sickness, suffering, and death. It ushers in the end of the poverty, injustice, and oppression. 
It anticipates the end of strife, conflict, and war. It forecasts a future world of peace, happiness, and enduring fellowship with Christ and the redeemed of all ages forever from the Bible study guide. Okay. One thing, nowhere in the scriptures does it say that when the Lord comes back the second time to take us home, there's not, there's not going to be billions or millions or even one who after death went to heaven and then going to be coming nobody, back with nobody him. coming back. Right. <laughs> but uh, there are very few Christians all over the world who believe that uh, when we, when folk die in the Lord, they're waiting for him to come. Mm -hmm. But this t teaching is all over. Well, mm -hmm. my father is in heaven. My, yeah. my mother is in heaven. They're so. dancing. They're, 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 they're dancing. having drinks or whatever. Yes, there is. Right, right, right. Okay, can you read us that next passage there, Charles, from Ellen White? From the writing of Ellen White. The coming of the Lord has been in all ages the hope of his true followers. The Savior's parting promise upon the olive that he would come again, lighted up the future of his disciples, filling their hearts with joy and hope that sorrow would not quench nor trial dim. trials dim. Amid the suffering and persecution, the appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ was the blessed hope. When the Thessalonian Christians were filled with grief, as they buried their loved ones who had hopes to live to witness the coming of the Lord Paul, the teacher pointed them to the resurrection to take place at the Savior's advent. Then the dead in Christ should rise and together the living be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so, he said, shall we ever be with the Lord? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, and that's Ellen White quoting in the Great Controversy, page 302. So, why is, it, why is the second coming so important to our faith? Especially because we know that the dead sleep. See lesson 10. Why does this teaching take on such importance? Without it, we would be, as Paul said, in an utterly hopeless situation. Okay, so now let's just compare and contrast Adventist belief with others that you've already started to talk about. If you believe that when you die, immediately your spirit departs to heaven, what's the point of a future resurrection? What, what, would, what would that accomplish? Anybody ever think about what's go, what, ha, what that experience would be if a, one go, went directly to heaven and they're powerless to do anything? It'd be like a hell for them, wouldn't yeah. it? Well. For yeah. some it would be. Yeah. Ellen White emphasizes that. Yeah. 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 So, <clears throat> um, why is the second coming so important as to our faith? Charles just read for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 59 says, More than that, uh, referring to if Christ did not arise from the grave, we are shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you are still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world said Paul. Yeah. But some, some disagree with that. They, well, in our day, there's some people who've disagreed with that. They think that but, this is the life to live anyway. Yeah, and we, I would agree with that. Uh, but you can understand what, why Paul would say that. I mean, remember every day, every word he spoke, every place he traveled, he, he recognized that one misstep, one misunderstanding, and his life could be threatened. That's not really a comfortable way to live. So, I mean, we need to sort of take that into account when we, when we read his, his words here. Now, I want to ask you a question that I've asked before. You're Paul. Just imagine yourself as Paul. You go to a pagan city that's never heard of Christianity, doesn't know anything about 
the Jewish situation at all. You know that there are a few Jews scattered around who are doing business and probably doing pretty well financially. And you say, okay, how am I going to tell, say, how, what am I going to say about the story of Jesus that is going to impress these people, make them even, even curious? Well, the best one that comes to mind is Mars Hill's. Mars Hill. Right. Mars Hill? Right. Yeah, the example of Paul. That was so beautiful. I stood yeah. there a few months back. Yeah. yeah. And what if, what a smart man. Yeah. But bas so basically what he's doing in the Mars Hill address is, is let me tell you about a God yes. that you claim that you're already worshiping. To the unknown God. Yeah. That was, that, that's a good approach. I think that probably more often, and, and I not, I'm not knocking that at all, more often, especially if you think what he said when he got down to Corinth, he said, the life and the death of Jesus, and I would add to make sure, his resurrection and ascension to heaven was probably the most impressive thing for most non-Christians. I mean, if you tell somebody, here's a person who lived this kind of a life, he was crucified, and they were, ha! Ah! You know, because crucifixion was absolutely the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in the Roman world in those days. And then you see, he was buried, and three days later, he came back to life and ascended to heaven, well, a short time after that. And I'm, I'm struggling myself. What did the pagans, how did they understand that? What, what, what did they make of that? How much different was it then than it is now? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really t tough to, I mean, even, even pe people who call themselves Christians, they have no idea what, what we, what we ha uh, have mm -hmm. embraced all these years. Well, uh, the, the great controversy theme mm. throughout history is the, the, the best key. way, really key. truly the key. Yeah. Uh, and we are the ones who have that understanding so why did Christ have to die on the cross, you see? They don't know. They make up stuff. Yeah. There's no, no biblical text properly translated that explains why, but it does, ex he, Jesus did say why he came and why he was born. Yeah. Yes. But nobody understands that. Yeah. He says, yeah, for truth. Yeah. They don't have, any, I like that commercial say, you can't handle the truth. Yeah. That's probably a pretty true statement. Well, what information do we have about the manner of Christ's second coming? We have some passages. Look at these in Acts 1, 9 to 11. The best one is, every eye shall see him. We'll get to that. Yes, Just, okay, yes sir. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Charles is enthusiastic here. Yes. Acts 1, 9 to 11. After this, he was taken up into heaven as they watched him and a cloud hid him from their sight. Okay, now I'm going to ask a question. Do you think it was raining that day? <laughs> no. no. So what kind of a cloud was that? Cloud of angels. Angels. Cloud of angels. You better, you better believe it. Okay, just to understand that. Go ahead. Okay, verse 10. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away. When two men, suddenly, two men dressed in white suddenly stood before them, and said, Galilean, Gal Galileans. Galileans, why are you standing there looking up at, at the sky? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Okay, same way. So he's there with them. He rises into the sky and he disappears into a cloud. So if he comes back, what'll happen? There'll be a cloud, and then he'll descend out of the cloud. And wouldn't that be the logical conclusion? I believe it says in Revelation. <laughs> okay, Charles, I'm going to come back to you and let you read your verse right there. Revelation 1-7. Look, he's coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. Okay, so... It's not going to come on a rocket ship or a, <laughs> a jet or... And it's not going to be, oh, rush Earth. over to Palm Springs. He's yeah, down he's in Palm... Dead. No, not going to be there. Everybody's going to see him. Well, Jim, I'm going to ask you to do the Matthew 24 version of that same story. Starting at verse 27 and 30 to 31. 
For the Son of Man will come like the lightning which flashes across the whole sky from the east to the west. Then the sign of the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Can I interrupt for just a second? Have any of you seen lightning go parallel with the, with the earth's surface? No. You don't usually see it that way. One time I was traveling from Washington, D.C. to East Africa, and we were flying across the central part of Africa, and there was a tremendous rainstorm. In fact, the pilot said he actually went around to try to avoid part of the storm. And we looked, I looked out there, and we saw some huge lightning strikes went straight across from one cloud to another cloud. I had never seen anything like that before. Boy, you just, whew, yeah. you know, and you're flying, you know, here you are, and, there, and there's, a, there's a lightning, you know. So, yeah. this, this, it gets your attention. Very quickly. Okay, go ahead. The great trumpet will sound and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other, from the Good News Bible. And I'm gonna propose something that, in light of what we've just read, there's one simple way, simple, clear way to distinguish between the coming of the true Christ and all the fakes that Jim just read to us about, the pretend prophets or the pretend Christ that will precede him. They're gonna come first. Just look up. When Jesus comes, the entire sky will be full of bright, shining angels, and everyone will see him in the sky. No, he, God will never allow any of Satan's fakes to try to duplicate the manner of his coming. And in second coming, he's not going to touch the earth. Yeah. Well, but right. I mean, this is... Yeah. I mean, all you have to yeah, do is look up. You look up, right? Let's right right see, is he touching the ground? Right, I mean, right, right. I, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying... It's easy. Just look up. Everyone will see him. Yes. <laughs> okay. Gordon? From the Bible Study Guide. Although the Protestant Reformers believed in the literal, visible, audible, and glorious return of Christ, gradually the understanding of this biblical truth changed. Popular 19th century preachers taught that Christ would come to establish his kingdom on earth and usher in a thousand years of peace. This led to spiritual lethargy and an apathetic commitment to spiritual values. Now, why would that be? Why would this lead to apathy? Well, if, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll change during that thousand years. Yeah, I mean, God's, God's going to come down here to earth. He's going to clean everything up. He's going to fix everything up. So what do I need to do? Yeah, I'll just wait till then. Yeah. Okay. Similarly, Christ's disciples misunderstood the nature of the Messiah's coming. They misunderstood? They thought that he would come as a conquering general who would break the yoke of Roman bondage, not one who would deliver them from the condemnation and shackles of sin. Oh dear. Thus, they failed to understand the manner of his coming, again from the Bible Study Guide. We know that when Christ came the first time as a baby boy, his coming was recognized by almost no one. However, that would not be the, <laughs> excuse me, that will not be true of his second coming. And think about this. Were there any people who knew that it was about time for Jesus, for the Messiah, let's, let's not say Jesus, who knew that it was about time for the Messiah to come? Certainly, certainly the devil did. Devil, yes, did, of course. But who else? Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Simeon, Anna. Yeah, Anna, Anna Simeon. We have talked right. about them already, but there's a large, wise very men. important group. Who? Those wise men. The wise well, men they, no, they were told. They, they had a signal. When Herod heard that Christ had been born, or that uh, potential thing, the he Jewish went to the. Knew. He went to, yeah, he went to the Sanhedrin, and they said, yeah, it's about time for the Messiah to come. They knew it was supposed to be time. What, what were they doing about it? Okay. Um, Where are we? Time for the, I think Myra, Ellen White there. Okay. One of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths really revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption 
to God's pilgrim people so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death, a precious, joy-inspiring hope is given in the promise of his appearing. Who is the resurrection and the life to bring home again his banished? The doctrine of the second advent is very is a is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. From the day when the first pair turned their sorrowing steps from Eden, the children of faith have waited the coming of the promised one to break the destroyer, destroyer's power and bring them again to the lost paradise. Wow. Great controversy page 299. And the Bible study goes, side goes on. An early Adventist leader, Luther Warren, used to tell young people the only way to be ready for the coming of Christ is to get ready and stay ready. I'll tell you another quick story about Luther Warren. He went to give, give a series of evangelistic meetings in Kingston, Jamaica. And there were a bunch of young pastors sitting on the front row because they were supposed to be learning how to be a pastor, how to give evangelist series. And he started preaching and he he covered the whole first evening's lecture in about five minutes. So he just went on to the next lecture and on to the next lecture and on to the next lecture. He covered the whole series of things that and the, the, pa the pastors and everybody was sitting with their mouths hanging over, what in the world is going on? And he said, I just, I just kept preaching. And that night there was the biggest earthquake that ever hit Kingston, Jamaica, and that place where they were holding the meetings was completely underwater. Oh. Wow. That, that, Earthquake occurred when? Later th that night. Later after that night. After he finished preaching. Mm. Mm. After he went through his whole series. Yeah, the the good Lord, and so he, he called people to, to 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 give themselves to God, and a lot of people came forward. Did they? Did, if Jesus does not plan to come back a second time, there was no reason for him to come the first time. Think about that for a little bit. Okay, Jim. This is God used the Protestant reformers to rediscover the truth about justification by faith in Christ alone. He used William Miller to dis rediscover the truth about the manner of Christ's second coming. As Miller studied scripture, he discovered a Christ who loved him more than he could possibly imagine. With his Bible, a pen, and a notebook, he began reading starting with Genesis and read no faster than he could understand the passage at hand. By comparing scripture with scripture, he allowed the Bible to explain itself. And there's a lot of verses that explain, give that general idea, how, that's how we should study the Bible. So what principles of Bible interpretation do, do you discover in these passages? And again, basically what he, what he did. When there was any passage or word that William Miller did not understand, he would look it up in the Bible concordance and find other passages in which that word was used and what it meant. Men like William Miller depended upon the Holy Spirit to guide them to their through their study. Okay, Charles? John chapter 16, verse 13. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. You want to do the next verse yeah, as well? Yeah, 2 there? Peter 1, 19 to 21. So we are even more confident in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You will do well to pay attention to it because it is like a lamp shining in the dark place until the day dawns and the light of the morning star shines in your hearts. Verse 20, above all else, however, remember that no one can explain by himself or herself a prophecy in the scriptures for no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as they spoke the message that came from God. Okay, following on with our story, William Miller was a dedicated student of Scripture. He set aside a fair amount of time each day to study his Bible, and the Holy Spirit revealed to him the truths of Scripture. It was a critical time for that information to be, to be understood. 
When reading the book of Daniel, comparing it with the book of Revelation, he was convinced that just as God revealed these great prophetic truths to Daniel and John, their fulfillment must be revealed to people living at the end of time. Gordon? Daniel 1, 17, God gave the four young men knowledge and skill in literature and philosophy. In addition, he gave Daniel skill in interpreting visions and dreams. Daniel 2, 45, you saw how a, this is uh, Daniel talking to the king, you saw how a stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it and how it struck the statue made of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God is telling your majesty what will happen in the future. I have told you exactly what you dreamt and have given you its true meaning from the Good News Bible. Go ahead with the next one as well. Re Revelation 1. This book is the record of the events that Christ Jesus revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. And John has told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the truth revealed by Christ, by Jesus Christ. Happy is the one who reads this book, that is uh, Revelation, and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what is written in this book. For the time is near when all these things will happen. And if you had taken a survey of the people who listened to that reading the first time, they would have guessed how many years until Christ came back. They would have been very disappointed. They wouldn't have had any idea that there was going to be the length of time. By the way, the reason it says, blessed is the one who reads, because very few people had training to be able to read in those days. I mean, you, basically because written material was had to be hand produced, it was very hard to, to, to do. So even paper, we call paper, the thing, papyrus and so forth that they used, was very expensive. So very few people learned to read. Myra? From the Bible study guide, the symbols of, in the prophetic books are not locked in mystery. A loving God has given his prophetic word to prepare us for the climactic events soon to unfold in this world. William Miller clearly understood that prophecy was its own best interpreter. The symbols of prophecy are made clear by the Bible itself. Beast, beasts represent kings or kingdoms in Daniel 7 um, verses there. Uh, wind re represents destruction in Jeremiah 49. Water represents people or nations in Revelation 17. The woman represents the church in Jeremiah and Ephesians. And the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation also are given in symbolic language with one prophetic day representing a literal year found in Numbers and Ezekiel. As William Miller applied these principles of biblical interpretation, he was startled at what he discovered regarding what he believed to be the timing of Christ's return. Bible study guide for Tuesday, May 14. So what would you think if a friend of yours, a Christian, even a Seventh-day Adventist, showed up one day and said, I have a wording in scripture that Jesus is coming next year? When he gives you a date. I'd say hooray, but I wouldn't believe. Yeah, yeah. because he himself said, no one, no one not even knows. I know. It was the day or the hour. Right, but you know, I grew up in Adventist and um, Bible classes, but the Lord chose not to reveal it to them. Yeah. The Lord chose uh, not to reveal. It probably prompted them to study and study more. Mm-hmm. Well, Daniel 7, 17 and 23 says, he said, these four huge beasts are four empires which will rise on earth. This is the explanation I was given. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and would be different from all other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. And then Jeremiah 49 that Myra referred to, 
I will make winds blow against Elam from all directions. That's one of the ancient countries near what we would call Iran today. And I will scatter her people everywhere until there is no country where her refugees have not gone. And Jeremiah 6, verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely, delicate woman. And there's a number of passages in the New Testament where uh, women are compared to, I mean, churches are compared to women. And Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel 4, 6 make it clear that in prophetic pre presentations, one day represents one calendar year. This is an essential understanding for uh, interpreting prophetic symbolism. Jim? William Miller, what did he do? Observed that events predicted by the prophets were precisely fulfilled. The 400 years of the sojourn of Abraham's descendants, Israel's 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the 70 years of Israel's captivity, and Daniel's 70 weeks allotted to Israel in Genesis, Numbers, Jeremiah, and Daniel. Okay. There's a very interesting, and I, I love this, it's really, I just, I'll listen. There's a very interesting and somewhat amusing anecdote that played a very important part in the story of William Miller. He thought that his Bible study would only be for his personal benefit. And he proceeded with that idea for several years. I mean, he was spending hours a day. I mean, he had a, regular, had a big farm and he was doing things, but he was really interested in this Bible study. And he proceeded with, with that, study for, that idea for several years. But he started to tell his family members what he was learning about, the, in this, this, particularly about the second coming of Jesus. When carefully studying the Bible book of Daniel, he believed that it predicted the time of the second coming. Some of his family members thought he should start telling people and, and, and do some preaching, but he refused. One Sunday morning, he was studying about six o'clock in the morning, and he essentially prayed, Lord, if in the next half hour, didn't give the Lord very much time, <laughs> in the next half hour, you send someone to my door with the message that they want me to come and preach to them at church, I will go. And lo and behold, his nephew showed up a short time later and asked him to come and preach at their church. Well, you could guess what happened. <laughs> he was upset and angry, but he went, and soon he had many invitations to preach all over New England. <clears throat> he struggled with Daniel 8:14. He wondered what was supposed to happen at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. What did it mean to say the sanctuary shall be cleansed? William Charles? Miller, William Miller accepted the popular view that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the purification of the earth by fire. He diligently studied the scriptures to understand an event of such stupendous importance. He discovered the linkage between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. In Daniel 8, the angel was instructed to make this man understand the vision, Daniel 8:16. By the end of this chapter, the only portion of the entire vision of Daniel 8 left unexplained. See Daniel 8 uh, verse 27 was the part about 2300 days. Later, the angel returned to Daniel and declared, I've now come forth to give you skill to understand Daniel 9, 922. See also, okay, this was help him understand about the 2300 day prophecy. Now here's another question for you. Several years passed between Daniel 8 and Daniel 9. Why did God not give him the answer right away? He was supposed to study for himself. So I'm sure he did when, that. When it when the explanation came, he understood it. He, he would see it, it, where how the yeah, pieces fit. He would fit. put the pieces together mm -hmm. and not just hear the explanation. He would understand it, comprehend it. Mm -hmm. So you think he understood the 2300 days as being 2300 years? Probably not. <laughs> what was he praying for? Do you remember? This is the end of the 70 years. He was praying for the end of the 17-year period of captivity prophesied already by Jeremiah. Okay, well, let's for, for read on. People to go home to... Home to, to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay, where are we? 
Myra, I think that's yours, Daniel 8, 16. I heard a voice call out Myra. from the river Uli. Gabriel explained to him the meaning of what he saw. And Daniel 8, 27, I was depressed and ill for several days. Then I got up and went back to the work that the king had assigned to me, but I was puzzled by the vision and could not understand it. Okay, just as what I mentioned a moment ago, the best dating of Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 suggests that there were several years between the giving of those two messages. Apparently, Daniel had some time to try to figure out what was meant by Daniel or in Daniel 8. Myra? Daniel 9, 22 to 27. He explained, Daniel, I have come here to help you understand the prophecy. When you began to plead with God, he answered you. He loves you, and so I have come to tell you the answer. Now, pay attention while I explain the vision. Note this and understand it. From the time the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses and will stand for seven times 62 years. But this will be the time of troubles. And at the end of, this, of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. The city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. At the end, the end will come like a flood, bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. The ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years. And when half of this time is past, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. The awful horror will be placed on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until what, the one who put it there meets the end which God has prepared for him. Good News Bible. Okay, now there's a lot of details there, but it's very clear if you get a good commentary and it's spelled out quite nicely in the SDA Bible commentary, how each exact one of these predictions here was filled, fulfilled right on time. So we know this from our Bible study guide again. We know this because after bidding Daniel to, quote, consider the matter and understand the vision, Daniel 9, 23, the first words of the angel were, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. So when he says, I'm getting ready to explain you something, and then immediately starts talking about the prophecies, it suggests that that's what he's planning to do, right? The word translated determined literally means cut off. 70 weeks or 490 years are to be cut off, but from what? The vision of the 2300 days, obviously the only part of Daniel 8 that Daniel did not understand and that the angel now came to explain. And there was no other prophecy that was long enough to cut off 490 years. And since the starting point of the 70 weeks was from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, Daniel 9.25, Miller knew that if he, had, if he had that date, he could know the beginning of the 70 weeks and the 2200-day prophecy. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and we're, I see the clock is running. Do you, think, do you think he was anxious to find out when that prophecy was given? Of course. <laughs> but th there were four commands mm -hmm. to rebuild, so we need to find out which one. Okay, was. we're going to move on to that. Right. But in order to determine whether the, when this 2300-day year prophecy would come to an end, he had to find out when it would start. He carefully studied the book of Ezra. Mm -hmm. Jim? Ezra chapter 7, verses 6 to 19. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes... Now that's pretty precise, isn't it? Okay. Ezra set out from Babylonia for Jerusalem with a group of Israelites, which included priests, Levites, temple musicians, temple guards, and workmen. They left Babylonia on the first day of the first month, and with God's help, they arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. Artaxerxes gave the following document to Ezra. From Artaxerxes, the emperor, to Ezra the priest, scholar in the law of the God of heaven. 
I command that throughout my empire, all the Israelite people, priests and Levites, that so desire be permitted to go with you to Jerusalem. You are to spend this money carefully and buy bulls, rams, lambs, corn, and wine, and offer them on the altar of the temple of Jerusalem in Jerusalem. Now, let me interrupt for a second. Why would he tell them to go and buy all that stuff? Mm. I skipped over part of it because we didn't, we had to keep this lesson a little bit shorter. He was saying, go there and offer these sacrifices. Bless me and my sons. So he's asking for a, for a blessing for the emperor. Okay, go ahead. You may use the silver and gold that is left over for whatever you and your people desire in accordance with the will of your God. Good news. Those are the key words. This was the first time that money was designated for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Now, previously, they had, had some stuff designated for the building of the temple. But now this is the first time money was allowed to be used for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And that was the key, wasn't it? For the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, not the temple, but Jerusalem. Uh, Charles, the decree was issued. The decree, the decree was issued by Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Was he the husband of Esther? Or what? No. No, no, this is, this is uh, what, the son of that one. No. Artaxerxes. But it is not, it's not the same one. It's he, not the same, okay. King of Persia, 457 BC. <laughs> this decree was the last of the three decrees to allow the Jews to return to rebuild Jerusalem and restore temple worship services. This third decree was the most complete and marks the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. And we've mentioned that this is the first time they were specifically given because remember what was happening? Their enemies were trying to tear down the walls so they couldn't, they couldn't make Jerusalem secure. So now he's given specific instructions. Yes, you can rebuild the wall. Daniel 9, uh, 25, 26. Uh, when would this entire prophetic period begin? What major events do those verses predict? Okay. This is Bible study guide. Did you want me to continue? Go ahead, Gordon. Continuing from the Bible study guide. In this remarkable prophecy, Daniel predicted that from, quote, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem to the Messiah would be 69 prophetic weeks or 483 prophetic days or literal years. Since the decree went forth in the fall of 457 BC, 483 years and extend to the fall of A.D. 27. The word Messiah signifies the anointed one. In the Christ also means anointed. Messiah is Hebrew, Christ is Greek, it means the anointed one. Go ahead. In the autumn of A.D. 27, Christ was baptized and received the anointing of the Spirit. After his baptism, Jesus went into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. Okay. What do they say Jesus was, was baptized instead of Christ? It, he was just, the, it meant he was the anointed, but he, Yeshua was his, was his name, which is his, descriptive of what he was. He, yeah. he is a healer. Yash, Yahweh saves. Yeah. You know, you call him the Christ. If you called him the Christ, that's a little bit different. Just his name was not Christ. Yeah, well, yeah. it was Messiah. Messiah, but it was Jesus was his human name, and Messiah or Messiah was his uh, divine well, name. His. So, William Miller compared the prophecies of Daniel with the words of Jesus, Matthew twenty four fifteen to twenty eight. Yeah. Myra, okay. you will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. It will be standing in the holy place. Now, I'm going to interrupt for a second. What, what was the awful horror? Do you remember how that was fulfilled? When the Romans conquered Jerusalem, they took a statue of Zeus and placed it, I don't know, it was actually in the most holy place, but there, claiming this was the God that they were supposed to worship after that. Yeah. This was the first destruction of the temple. 
No, this is this is the Roman destruction. This is the Roman. Okay, this. Mm -hmm. AD the awful right, horror right. was they took the, the <coughs> destroyed the temple of what? Zeus and put it in place of yeah, in the holy place. Then those who were in Judea must run away to the hills. Someone who is on the roof of his house must not take the time to go down and get his belongings from the house. Someone who is in the field must not go back and get his cloak. How terrible will it be in those days for the woman who is pregnant and for mothers with little babies. Pray to God that you will not have to run away during the winter or on Sabbath. When, if someone asks, says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear, and they will perform great miracles and wonders in order to deceive even God's chosen people, if possible. Listen, I have told you this before the time comes. Okay, we're going to jump over a little bit because we're running out of time. Jesus himself said that they should be careful to study and understand the prophecies of Daniel. Jesus fulfilled in every possible way the predictions for the first part of that uh, prophecy of Daniel. So in the spring of AD 31, the middle of this prophetic period uh, uh, this week, three and a half years after his baptism, Jesus was crucified. The system of offerings that was then uh, that pointed forward to the Lamb of God ended and so forth. Um, and again, you can go back and look at all that in Daniel 9, 27. The 70 weeks or 490 years, especially allotted to the Jews, ended in AD 34 with the rejection by the Sanhedrin of the gospel message. And what did they do? They stoned Stephen. And who was listening? Well, Saul. Saul. He was there watching. And it says he voted to have Stephen stoned. Okay, so Acts 8, 1 says, And Saul approved of Stephen's murder. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. And what was the result of that? Spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel. Okay, Jim, maybe you can read Subtracting 490. Subtracting 490 years from the 2300-year prophecy leaves 810 years for the completion of the prophecy. 1,800. What did, what did I say? 1,800. Huh? You said 8 instead of 18. I thought, yeah, okay. I, this leads us to 1844. William Miller and the early Adventists believe that the sanctuary in Daniel 8:14 was the earth, and they assumed that Christ would come to purify the earth by fire in 1844. Yeah, how would you feel like if you were standing and waiting for Christ to show up and you know that he's going he's gonna to purify the earth by fire? Okay. Look at the following chart for the prophecies of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. The prophecies start in 457 B.C. and foretell the events surrounding Messiah the Prince upon whom the 70-week prophecy is grounded. With that solid foundation, the 2300-day prophecy ends in 1844. So there you see it. It's, um, it's a little bit garbled on the screen, but 457 to AD 34, and AD 34 was the three and a half years after Christ was crucified. The, the, the Christians were scattered, began to carry the gospel through the whole world, and then so you add 1810 years to that, and you come to 1844. And Charles? Like the first disciples, William Miller and his associates did not themselves fully comprehend the import, import of the messages which they bore. Errors that had been long established in the church prevented them from arriving at a correct interpretation as an important point of the prophecy. Therefore, though they proclaimed the message which God had committed to them, to give to the world, yet through a misinterpretation, misapprehension of its meaning, they suffered disappointment. Yet God accomplished his own beneficial, beneficent purpose in permitting the warning of the judgment to be given just as it was. The great day. Let me interrupt just a moment because we're running out of time. 
If you start announcing that Christ is coming on a specific date, you get people's attention. And there were thousands and thousands of people, probably more than 100,000 people, who basically accepted the Millerite message. And then, of course, a great disappointment came. And uh, we're going to drop down here and talk a little bit about that. What happened after the great disappointment? You can be sure that the devil correctly understood the prophecies of Daniel. He did everything he possibly could do to prevent the arrival of the life and the death of Jesus Christ. And when I say the death, the, me the true meaning of the death of Christ, he didn't want people to know. However, prophecy was precisely fulfilled. Protestant Christianity was clearly the religion of, that early pilgrim, of the early pilgrim Puritans who traveled to what later became the United States of America. Gordon, can you? Hope and optimism, this is from the Bible Study Guide. Yeah. Hope and optimism filled the atmosphere of the 19th century United States, the new nation born out of the unique American Revolution. The century brought social, economic, political, as well as technological changes and inventions, promising the dawn of a new world. And they began to think that the world would get better and better and that Jesus would come not at the beginning of the thousand years, but rather at the end of the thousand years. So, so this is a, to say that he's coming at the end is called post-millennialism. Go ahead. So, but what is post-millennialism? Millennialism means, millennialism comes from the word millennium, which refers to the thousand years of Christ's reign with the saints as described in Revelation 20. While most Christians accept the biblical teaching about the millennium, not all agree on how to relate the millennium to the second coming and to the last judgment from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. So which is going to come first? Uh, different people. So the question is, is Jesus going to come first and then fix everything in this world? Or is the millennium going to come first? Well, Jesus is going to come first and then the millennium happens later. Um, that's a very moot point among Christian scholars even today. And so we want to try to understand that. Um, and it, of course, it was a great disappointment for the Adventist people and the thousands that believed Miller, William Miller shrunk down to a fairly small group, but they got the answer. And we'll talk about that next time. And by Adventists, you don't mean Seventh-day Adventists because no. that church hadn't been founded That's right. for some time yet. Yeah, this was, uh, the, the Adventists were both people who believed in the advent of Jesus Christ. That's, Joshua that's, Lee that's, Himes was the major, a major publisher yeah. back then. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of studying these materials together, of reviewing the history of Christianity and major events that have taken pl place. Now, help us to understand how these impact, these important points might impact our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.